We do begin with breaking news at this hour. The jury of a Spokane murder trial reached a verdict today. That jury finding Yazir Daraji guilty of second degree murder and harassment for killing his ex-wife in 2020. Krem 2's Amanda Rowley was the only reporter in the courtroom this afternoon. She's joining us here in the studio now, studio now with the latest. Yeah, Whitney, the murder trial for Yasir Daraji lasted about three weeks and the jury spent Thursday afternoon and this morning deliberating before they reached a verdict. Now, an autopsy report confirmed Daraji's ex-wife was strangled to death, but then investigators also determined he later placed the victim's body in her car and set it on fire and it was found located on Spokane's South Hill. Court documents say the couple divorced in 2015. The two also had a history of several domestic dispute incidents over the last several years. Now, Daraji has maintained his innocence, but prosecutors remained confident the evidence would prove otherwise, including the medical examiner's testimony that the victim's injuries are consistent with strangulation and that his DNA was found on the steering wheel cover and window lock of the victim's car. Then, with only about a day spent deliberating, the jury found Daraji guilty of murdering his ex-wife. We, the jury, find the defendant, Yasser Daraji, guilty of the crime of secondary murder as charged in count one. And that's dated with today's date and signed by the presiding juror. Verdict form for count two reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, Yasser Daraji, guilty of the crime of harassment as charged in count two. Now you can see in that video, Daraji really didn't react to that verdict. In fact, he remained emotionless the entire time he was in court today. I also noticed the courtroom was empty this afternoon with no sign of any family or friends. Now at this time, the prosecuting attorney told me a statement from her office or the victim's family may be released later this week. Meantime, Daraji's defense attorney, Rob Cossey, told me he does not know if Daraji will appeal his case. Amanda Rowley, Creme 2 News. All right, Amanda, thank you. Well, it has now been more than a week since four University of Idaho students were killed in their off-campus home in Moscow. Last Sunday, Ethan Chapin, Zana Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonsalves were found stabbed to death. Now, a week later, Moscow police still don't have a motive, a murder weapon, or a suspect. Over the weekend, we did get a few more details about the 911 call that came in, as well as the conditions of the victims when they were found. So here are three things we learned throughout this weekend. Police cleared up some rumors surrounding the 911 call that was made last Sunday, just before noon. They said the call was made using a surviving roommate's phone by a friend who had been called to the home. Multiple people spoke to dispatch on that call and police say none of them are being considered suspects. The night of the murders, Madison and Kaylee uh, reportedly called an unknown male multiple times. Police say he is also not considered a suspect. The Moscow police chief, though, has said they do not know if the victims were killed by one person or if perhaps there was another killer. One individual kill four people at night and not wake up the other two roommates. Our um, investigation will continue to look at all avenues of that investigation. Um, I cannot disclose um, any of that information. I don't even know that information at this point in time, and that's why we're continuing to investigate. In the meantime, the Lataw County coroner has said the four students were likely asleep when they were killed. Some had some defensive wounds. Each victim was stabbed multiple times. Authorities found no signs of sexual assault. Moscow police are saying at this time in the investigation, they do not believe the two surviving roommates or a man seen standing near a local food truck were involved in any way in the murders. Moscow PD also did share the two surviving roommates had been out last Saturday night, but returned home by 1 a.m. and did not wake up until later on Sunday. They have also investigated the private party driver who took Kaylee and Madison home. They say they do not believe he is involved in the murders either. And today, the first funeral is being held for one of those victims, Ethan Chapin. He was the only male victim, and he was Zana's boyfriend. Both of them were killed. Crime 2's Mark Hanrahan is joining us now with more about Ethan. Whitney, Ethan had just turned 20 years old. He was just a couple of months into his freshman year at the University of Idaho, and his parents had just visited Ethan and his siblings the weekend before police say he was killed. In his obituary, it's quoted that Ethan loved life, 
laugh continuously and that he was a kind friend to all. Ethan was the firstborn of triplets and attended the University of Idaho with both his brother and his sister. Ethan was also described as an avid golfer, surfer, and loved to play volleyball and pickleball. His funeral will be held in the same town he attended school, Mount Vernon, over on the west side. Today, Ethan's mom, with his brother and sister at her side, delivered an emotional statement. Take a listen. So my name is Stacy Chapin. <laughs> I thought I could do this. Today we're here to honor the life and legacy of our son and brother, Ethan Chapin, one of the most incredible people <laughs> you'll ever know. Together we want to extend gratitude to the following. Our neighbors in Mount Vernon and LaConnor, Washington, and the local communities of Priest Lake and Moscow, Idaho, for their ongoing support and care. Our extended family and friends who serve as beacons of strength and remain by our, by our side throughout every moment. The Moscow Police Department, who now carry the burden every day, not only for us, but for all of the impacted families and the many strangers across the country, your outreach and kind words are profoundly touching. Please know we now consider all of you friends. And lastly, we thank the media for keeping this story top of mind. Thank you. Ethan's parents said that Ethan was sleeping over at his girlfriend, Zana Kernodal's house the night that they were killed. They, like everyone else, just waiting for answers as to who killed their son and why. Whitney. All right, Mark, thank you very much. In the meantime, there has been an incredible outpouring of emotion following this tragedy. People all across the Inland Northwest looking for ways to support those families of the victims. Happening right now, the Coeur d'Alene Texas Roadhouse, which is where Zana used to work, is holding a fundraiser in honor of all of those victims. Our Kyle Simchuk is there tonight. And Kyle, what's been the reaction from the community that you've seen tonight? Well, just a bunch of people here. When, when we first got here about an hour ago, there was a line of people out the door eager to get in asking about this fundraiser. And we also talked to some people. They had no idea there was even a fundraiser going on tonight, but they said, hey, we're going to have to order extra steaks tonight. Maybe take them home. They just want to support these families as much as they can. And we do know that Zaina Kernodal, one of the students killed, she worked at this Texas Roadhouse before leaving for the University of Idaho. The restaurant said in a Facebook post, she will be dearly missed. Our deepest condolences go out to families and friends of these four students. Now, the fundraiser will also help the other three families of Ethan Chapin, Madison Mogan, and Casey Gonzalez. So here's the details for tonight's event. It's from 3 to 9 p.m. The restaurant will donate 10% of sales, and if you donate $5, you'll get peanuts and a free appetizer. Now, there's also a raffle, and we're told that all of those proceeds from the raffle will go to these four families. I saw one person walk out with just a giant handful of yellow tickets. He says he doesn't even know what the prizes are. He doesn't care if he wins, but he donated $50 and he says that two of his granddaughters are going to be attending college soon. And this story has just shaken him. He's devastated for these families, as are so many other people in this community and around the country. Texas Roadhouse also has four posters just outside the entrance where people can uh, sign a message for the family. Those will be delivered to family members. So again, this is going on from 3 to 9 p.m. tonight. 10% of those sales will go to the families. Whitney, send it back to you. All right, Kyle, thank you very much tonight. And Crime 2 is dedicated to bringing you the latest developments in this investigation. Our coverage of the University of Idaho student deaths continues on Crime 2 Plus, which is available for download right now on Roku and Amazon. In the meantime, in other news, a temporary burn restriction is in place for Spokane County, but it has now expired. Several days ago, though, the Spokane Regional Clean Air Agency put the county under a stage one yellow burn ban, meaning the use of fireplaces, non-EPA certified wood burning stoves and other non-certified burning devices were prohibited in the Spokane County smoke control zone. That burn ban, again, no longer in place right now. However, our air quality does remain in the moderate zone. So on that note, you might be feeling some of the impacts from that stagnant air. Our chief meteorologist, Jeremy Legoo, kind of told us that this was happening. It, it sounds like all the factors were in place, you know, at the end of last week, Jeremy, and it really kind of all fell into place over the weekend. Yeah, you know, and the good news and I guess kind of bad news in this situation is that there is a big shift headed toward us over the course of the next couple of days. And that means 
Improving air quality, and we're already starting to see it. Earlier today, we were unhealthy for sensitive groups. Right now, we're seeing improvements. But look, you can see that smoky haze on the low levels of the horizon. That smoky haze actually correlates to, well, the unhealthy air. Right now, we sit at 34 degrees, but temperatures are going to drop overnight. Here's where I think things get interesting. Notice we fall back down into the 20s. That's where things set the stage for an incoming round of rain and snow to have the biggest impact. So we are going to see that snow from the Cascades all the way through to the northern Rockies, but mixed in the middle is going to be a wintry mix and freezing rain. Freezing rain is likely in a few of those locations with our incoming storm. So basically, as this storm moves in, we pull in some warm, wet air from the southwest. That is going to be warmer than the ground is, and as it falls, it is likely going to cause freezing rain problems. So timing it out, tomorrow morning, early in the morning, it hits the Cascades. Watch what happens by, say, the 11 o'clock hour. It's knocking on the door. Notice some of that freezing rain continues to fall just out to our west. Off to the north, it is snow up in the Cascades, and then that freezing rain and snow and even rain move through the inland northwest. It is going to be a very soggy Tuesday. High elevations, all rain. Lower ones, including Spokane, could see a wintry mix and freezing rain at the onset. Whitney? All right, Jeremy, thank you very much. It's now been less than a month since the Salvation Army took over operations at the new Trent Avenue homeless shelter here in Spokane. They now replaced the Guardians Foundation after the city abruptly ended that contract last month. Well, now in partnership with the city and the county, they have brought in additional outdoor bathrooms and storage areas for people staying there. They're also working to add more shower trailers, new beds, blankets and sheets and other items for the community area there. Today, I had a chance to talk one on one with Major Ken Perrine of the Salvation Army, and he tells me the goal is to continue bringing in as many people as possible out of the cold and away from the tent encampment along I-90 known as Camp Hope. Well, for the Salvation Army, we have uh, certain standards that how we operate our shelters. So very, from the very beginning, we're working on trying to increase those uh, standards, bringing up to our regular standard. Are you finding that these changes are making it more of an inviting place for people to come from Camp Hope? I would say when we get to the point we want to, uh, the changes that we're going to make are going to make it a space where people will want to be here rather than Camp Hope or just on the street. Right now, the new Trent shelter has about 275 people staying there every night. And this weekend, Governor Jay Inslee made a surprise visit to the homeless encampment off of I-90 and Freya. Like we just said, it is Camp Hope. This is a picture that Jules Helping Hands posted online yesterday. Krem2 did reach out to the governor's office to speak with him about the, his impression of that camp. He stopped apparently for a brief time before going to the Gonzaga game on Sunday. And according to the governor's office, he was impressed at the progress being made to secure the site.